Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerSportsBetting.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News for our podcast, DwyerBoxingNews.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. So I'm just starting my day. I have a court hearing at 1.30 here. And so what am I doing to let off steam? I'm online with you talking boxing. Let's talk sports finance. Let's talk boxing finance. You have an ongoing major development in the sport, and it's major. It's the decoupling of fighters from long-term promotional contracts, right? I think it's a welcome development. Let me backtrack just a little bit. You remember the NBA years ago? You remember Michael Jordan, who's now in his 50s? You remember when he was in his 30s? And you remember when he was a little bit upset at what the Chicago Bulls were offering him. And so Jordan decided rather than take the financial security of a long-term deal. And let's be clear here. When you're a multimillionaire, you already have financial security. Right? LeBron James already has financial security. Right? But rather than take the security of a long-term deal, Jordan decided that he was only going to play on year-to-year -year contracts. Well, I encourage everyone to look this up. We're talking about more than 10 years ago. And, of course, the Chicago Bulls at that point, since Jordan was the best player in the league and was an icon of the sport, right? Since Jordan was a fan favorite. The Bulls understood that Jordan's actual market price per year was well north of the maximum allowed in the sport if you were not re-signing your own player. They used to have what was called the Larry Bird exception, right? So, of course, the Bulls had to pay Jordan, again, this was more than 10 years ago, more than $30 million a year, right? 30 mil. Now, understand, Jordan had a lot of risk involved in the deal. Had he blown out his knee, had he not delivered, right? Then, of course, the team, the very next year, could have said, Mike, we don't want to pay you 30 odd million dollars a year. We want to pay you significantly less, right? The point, though, is Jordan was making more, more than 10 years ago, by going year to year, than today's highly paid players, and that includes Kobe, that includes LeBron, are making from their NBA teams, right? More than a decade later, right? The year-to-year -year nature of Jordan's contract allowed him to get top dollar. As market conditions change, you're able to change along with them. Also, there's always the threat of going to a different bidder. Right? The Bulls understood they had to pay Jordan or Jordan was going to walk out the door. He wasn't contractually tethered to the Chicago Bull franchise. Now let's talk about boxing. Understand boxing has had a long history of promoters coming in and promoting huge events and then walking away from the sport. Right? I believe and double check me on this. I believe former owner of the Washington Redskins, Jack Kent Cook, was part of the promotion for perhaps the sport's biggest moment, the first Ali Fraser fight, featuring at the time two unbeaten guys with a claim at having a share of the heavyweight title, two Olympic gold medalists, Right, fighting in New York City to figure things out.
right after Ali was allowed to return to the sport from the exile caused from his refusal to serve in Vietnam. Right? Well, just understand, Jack Ken Cook was involved in that promotion. Understand, a lot of innovation came from that promotion, right? Because they had closed circuit and all this other stuff. But just understand that there's precedent for promoters being a part of the sport for specific fights and not having long-term promotional contracts with the fighters. Well, the reason it's an issue now is, of course, Golden Boy Promotions has announced, and keep in mind, Golden Boy prefers long-term deals with their fighters. Golden Boy has announced that it won't do deals with Al Heyman managed fighters who don't sign long-term deals with the promotional company. Right now, from where I sit, and trust me, I'm, I'm not a boxing insider. I'm really sitting out in the bleacher section, right? I'm really more of a commentator and a gambler. I'm not, you know, uh, the consummate insider. Um, from where I sit, I don't know what Golden Boy's doing. Right? I find this business strategy to be curious. Understand, if I'm a uh, movie studio and I get the opportunity to work with superstar actors, Morgan Freeman, right? uh, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Robert Redford, Sidney Poitier, um, Jeremy Irons, right? let's say that Meryl Streep, Let's say that some great actors are willing to work with me on a movie. As far as I'm concerned, that's more beer for me. That's great. That means the movie is going to be that much better. That means that these superstars have confidence in my work and are willing to be a part of the project. Now, I don't understand how you get from there a win-win, right? The superstars are in a movie that they want to be in right? I'm actually involved in making the movie. I get to make the movie with all these superstars in it. This event just got a whole lot bigger, right? I couldn't imagine under those circumstances then saying to Meryl Streep, hey Meryl, I know you're willing to be in this movie. Um, before I allow you to do so, I need an exclusive five-year deal on the next five years of your career. What leverage would I have to treat Meryl Streep that way? Wouldn't there be a lot of studios in town dying to have Meryl Streep appear in their film project? Am I really going to jeopardize my film project by making outrageous demands that because this very talented actor is willing to work on my project, she should tether herself to me for the next five years. Right? Keep in mind, too, her career is already built. Right? She's gotten awards too many to mention in this short video. So I don't even have the rationale of arguing that I've built up her career. Right? She's coming to me with a built-up career. Keep in mind, too, she doesn't need my studio's promotional arm to further her career because, of course, today we have social media here on the internet. She has her own team. She has her own business manager. She has her own PR person, right? She has her own enterprise. She doesn't need my enterprise to promote her career. Also, does she even need a promoter at that point because aren't there people out there who are dying to see Meryl Streep movies so as I suspected right and again this is a highly subjective video I'm just giving you my views you can question any part of my views that you want you can further even tell us about it by leaving comments in the comment section to this video 
but not surprisingly to me other promoters have stepped in they've leapt at the opportunity to have some of the fighters that Al Heyman manages fighters with constituencies fighters with fans who want to see them fight fighters with proven ratings on television on cable right not surprisingly other promoters see the cash cow here other people will step in to promote fights by folks like Adrian Broner so according to rumors and again this is the view from the bleacher seats not the dugout right I'm a fan just like you right um, According to rumors, Goosen Promotions is willing to work with Al Heyman on future boxing events. Right? Sounds to me like Goosen Promotions is going to make a boatload of money. Right? Keep in mind, I don't know how you hurt your brand by being a part of events with superstars that attract a lot of fans right let me also say this too Adrian Broner has an interest in having his fights properly promoted the fighters themselves want to be properly presented to their fans right the promoter is not the only one with an interest in a great promotion these fighters right have an interest in the promotion so understand what's gonna happen right goose and promotions now is gonna get increased experience and exposure right they're gonna be promoting fights in places like Las Vegas right in my opinion the current Mecca of boxing right certainly on the short list let's agree with that right I understand the Bell Center has their argument Madison Square Garden always has its argument Barclay Center is on the map too right understood but just understand that in one of boxing's biggest markets Las Vegas where Carl Frotch wants to fight Goose and Promotions is now getting an opportunity that is jaw-dropping right they get to promote fights in Vegas learn the Vegas market have Merrill Street level talent really right as part of the event right Al Heyman has a wide stable of fighters right they get to be a part of that event and the fighters get to see the kind of job they're doing understand when you don't have long-term promotional contracts clouding the issue then the fighters are actually able to say hey I'm gonna fight this guy and you know what for this big an event I want to make sure it's properly promoted I want us to use then they can pick the promoter right if the promoter is so willing most importantly and I say most importantly is that just like Jordan got a premium more than 10 years ago just like Jordan got top dollar without the long-term deal with the Chicago Bulls right so too with this added flexibility since you're negotiating things event by event right with this added flexibility the fighters in a very tough sport where many careers are short and where some fighters get impacted physically right have brain injury that affects them long term the fighters get top dollar right so let me say this I believe this development is unsettling to many. 
If you have skin in the game, if you're an investor in Golden Boy Promotions, as you can imagine, this development isn't your most favorite development in the sport because you're hoping to have a portfolio of fighters with nowhere else to go. It's like having a portfolio of stocks, right? You want to sign Adrian Broner once to a five-year deal and then just know that you have the contractual right to promote Broner for the full five years, right? The fact that you might be getting Broner if he wins big fights on the front end at less than his market value is just an added bonus for you. That's your share of the profits, or at least a big part of it, right? So I understand that the golden boys of the world don't like this development. Here's what I don't understand, and let's be critical here, right? I don't understand why so many in the press are criticizing this development, right? It's not like anyone involved in decoupling fighters from long-term promotional contracts is trying to defraud the public, right? Understand the people involved are trying to deliver quality fights to you. So Richard Schaefer, when he was with Golden Boy, right? Golden Boy's earlier management when Oscar was unavailable. That's how we'll put it, right? Richard Schaefer was putting on great fights, wasn't he? Under the Golden Boy banner with boxing's equivalent of Meryl Streep level talent, right? Floyd Mayweather, Adrian Broner, right? Against big time opponents, right? Robert DeGhost Guerrero and others. Right? Big time opponents, big time fights, fights we wanted to see. Right? Why hasn't he been congratulated for that? By the boxing media. I understand that investors in Golden Boy, Oscar De La Hoya, were upset with that arrangement because Floyd Mayweather wasn't tethered to Golden Boy contractually for several years, right? Just like I'm sure the Chicago Bulls were privately upset that their best player delivering the league's best performances, Michael Jordan, wasn't tethered to them for several years, right? Jordan was getting paid year to year, right? But just like basketball fans in the 1990s had the benefit of seeing the league's best player, Michael Jordan, so too has the boxing public had the benefit of watching Floyd Mayweather in his career, right? Even when Floyd hasn't been tethered to some promoter on the basis of a long-term contract. So I don't understand the backlash guys like Richard Schaefer are getting. I just don't. I don't know why we're supporting or should support these big promotional companies in their quest to lock up fighters in contracts for several years. Isn't that one of the problems of the sport? A fighter is locked up in a deal for several years and then the promoter, and I know if fighters are watching this video, they know what I'm talking about, then the promoter doesn't get them the big fights the promoter has a group of favorite fighters who are fan favorites who might not even be as good as we'll call them Fighter A. But Fighter A has no power because Fighter A is locked into a long-term deal. And if his promoter won't deliver for him, then his career is on ice. Why is that preferable to a situation where these fights are on a fight-by-fight -fight basis, right? And an established superstar can say, you know what, I'm not going to sign a long-term promotional deal this time around, right? What I'm going to do is, since I have a pre-existing relationship with this promoter, so I'm going to say, hey, you know, 
See if you can get me a fight with this person. Or see if you can get me a fight with that person. And if they can't deliver, then I'm going to go to promoter B. I'm going to go to promoter C. I'm going to tell my manager, work with whatever promoter you need to work with to get me this high-quality fight. Let me close by saying, I know a lot has happened lately with regard to Rock Nation making a $40 million offer over five years to Adrian Broner. Right? Broner at first used colorful language in rejecting it. But then Broner diplomatically right, uh, admitted that he had made some mistakes in his uh, colorful language and apologized. Right, Still didn't take the deal but apologize for, let's say, being a bit uh, colorful in uh, rejecting the deal. Just understand that in boxing, though I don't know the specifics of this deal, as I said, my view is from the bleacher seats, right? Um, but, but, just understand that in boxing, just like in the NFL, these deals are often illusory. In other words, if you follow pro baseball, right, and you hear a guy has signed a five-year, $40 million deal, what that means is the guy's going to get his $40 million, right, as long as he's out there playing baseball. Right, as long as he's not doing things to get himself, you know, suspended from the sport for life. Right? The guy can tear an ACL, the guy can have a detached retina. Uh, the guy's gonna get paid his forty million dollars. Right? That's the way baseball is set up. But just to understand now we have public relations contracts. For example, in the NFL, everyone knows that Colin Kaepernick big money deal is fake. Right, that's a um, perform for pay contract. They call it a long-term deal, but Kaepernick has to produce every year to get the money. Understand in boxing, you have these deals where the promoter can leave you if you don't win. They can call it a five-year deal. Hell, they could call it whatever they want to call it. Right. If the promoter is able to say, you know what, you're not as good as I thought you were. You know, a year or two into the contract, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk away from this deal. I'm not going to, in the parlance of the uh, trade, pick up the options for the remaining years of your contract. Or I'm going to exercise this buyout clause and I'm going to get out of here. Right? So in the press, they say five year, $40 million deal. In reality, your guarantee on the deal is a hell of a lot less than $40 million. Here's the catch though. The way these contracts are typically written, right? The promoter gets to walk away from the deal not you the fighter right not you the fighter let me go one step further if you're cynical like me if you're at times a conspiracy theorist like me right you might even believe that some of these deals tie up fighters let's say you're really talented but you're unknown or you're not the cash cow that a lesser talented fighter is and by the way that's the story of the sport, right? I would argue that Saul Alvarez is not the most talented guy at either junior middle or middle, but yet he gets top dollar over more talented fighters, right? Sometimes fans love vulnerability, right? They don't like surgical excellence in the ring, even though that fighter is being effective. Isn't that the claim we keep hearing about Guillermo Regundio? That he's brilliant, but hey, he's not a fan favorite. So think about it. You're a promoter. Let's be cynical for a second. 
I have a Canelo. Now, I'm just using these names simply for demonstrative purposes. I'm not saying this is reality. Right? But let's say I have a fan favorite but vulnerable fighter like Canelo. And let's say <coughs> he's making noise. Right? He's getting crowds. He's getting buzz. Now, let's say for argument's sake that I have a different fighter who the fans really don't know about that much. But I know fighter B beats Canelo in his sleep. And they're in the same weight class. Right? If I have a cash cow fighter like Canelo, why would I want to end the cash cow parade by having fighter B fight Canelo? Right? If fighter B beats Canelo, that ends my gravy train. Right? It allows fighter B to, you know, make more money and advance in the sport and stuff like that. But why do I want that to happen if I'm the promoter and I'm making a lot of money off Canelo? Now, if I have fighter B signed to a long-term deal, and if I signed fighter B when he was just a young pup coming up before he had any market power, then isn't it, from a business standpoint, in my best interest to keep Fighter B on ice? To keep Fighter B off the streets while I collect on my Canelo gravy tray? Right? I could even know Fighter B is the best pound for pound, or Fighter B is better than Canelo, and should be getting the championship opportunities I'm giving to Canelo. But I know if Fighter B wins, let's say Fighter B is Guillermo Regundio, we'll merge divisions, right? I know if Guillermo Regundio wins, then I'm going to lose these big crowds over here. Then I'm going to lose some money, right? So understand, these long-term promotional contracts, in my opinion, the view from the bleacher seats, right, give the promoters too much power to game the system, right? Too many talented fighters have been kept on ice, and I believe many of them know it, right? Doing fights on a fight-by-fight -fight basis when, as I like to say, you've reached a point in your career where you're recognized at the mall, where fans want to see your fights. Right? Do you really care when you're watching a Mayweather fight, whether it's Golden Boy Promotions or Mayweather Promotions? You don't care. You're interested in the action. You're interested in the talent. When I watch a movie, I'm not there thinking, wow, is this person represented by the William Morris Agency? That's not, that's not on the tip of my eye, you know, mine. I'm thinking of the actual performance. Right? So put me among those who really has no problem whatsoever with the decoupling of fighters from long-term promotional contracts. Right? If the fighters thought this through, I believe they would understand that you can work with promoters on a event-by-event -event basis. Right? Force these promoters to actually respond to market conditions. Don't have a situation where you sign away several years of your life, several years of your life. And then, of course, you don't get the quality fights that you want. Right? Well, keep an eye on this Golden Boy, Goosen Promotions, Al Heyman situation. Right? Heyman apparently bought a block of time with NBC Sports Network, according to reports. Right, and he's going to start putting on a series of fights in March. Right, understand as you can imagine, these fights are going to showcase fighters in his stable. Keep an eye on who promotes those events, keep an eye on the purses that the fighters get. Because keep in mind, right, this is a venture where Heyman has paid for the right to actually have these shows. Right? Also, the claim that Heyman doesn't have a promotional license 
misses the mark by quite a bit because these events will be promoted by a promotional company that does. Right? Why? Because it's a good deal for the promotional company. Just like it's a good deal for the fighters. Don't get caught up in hype and PR from rival promoters or from reporters seeking access to rival promoters trying to ingratiate themselves by coming up with press bias stories, right? The point here is that professional fighters should be paid and they shouldn't have their careers tied up for several years with promoters who might or might not be acting in their best interests at prices that might or might not reflect their true market value. Right? Michael Jordan, more than a decade ago, blessed us with his game. He got paid top dollar to do so, and he made more than 10 million more dollars than many NBA superstars are making today under a salary cap system right why the Jordan model is inferior to the current model which pays athletes less is beyond me perhaps you the viewer can explain in the comment section to this video thanks for indulging me here for more than half an hour I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video thanks for stopping by